Our next speaker, uh, Brad, uh, joined our firm in 2004, and within a relatively short period of time, he changed the way we gathered information, selected, valued, bought and sold stocks and other investment instruments in our portfolio. With a degree in computer science from one of the top schools in the country, he could be and probably should have been working for Google, Amazon, Uber, or Facebook with his other classmates. Instead, he decided to apply his skills to the investment business and is now recognized as one of the top, man uh, top managers in the industry by multiple institutional tracking services that follow and compare. His AdStar system, which he has designed from the ground up and wrote, has put us in the global stage and allows us now to recruit veteran first class managers like David and Mary and blend their experience with the digital, his digital age. In 2016, we named Brad our CIO, and however, it's not highly unlikely you'll see Brad on Bloomberg or TV uh, self-promoting. Instead, he can be found in his office in front of two computer screens watching over your money. Today, Brad will discuss his approach to generating a positive return in volatile and challenging markets. Thank you, Bill. Uh, good afternoon. Well, before I begin, I want to compliment David and Mary uh, on, on two very insightful presentations. We did not do a dress rehearsal this year, so that was the first time I heard it, so uh, job well done. Uh, okay, long, short investing in volatile markets. Uh, first, let me explain the terms long, short, and long, short. Uh, to go long simply means you buy a stock. You effectively, you're betting on the company. Uh, to go short is a bet against a company. The mechanics uh, can be a bit confusing. You borrow shares to sell in the open market and you immediately book a liability for your obligation to buy those shares in the future and return them to the original owner. But for the purposes of this presentation, think of it in terms uh, of long positions gain if a stock goes up and shorts um, gain if a stock falls and vice versa. There are three basic types of fund strategies, long only, short only, and long short. Uh, long short funds are the most dynamic uh, and traditionally entail uh, portfolio managers making pair trades, uh, which are bets that a particular company will underperform one of its competitors. Um, in addition, these funds have the flexibility to alter their long and short exposures based on where they think the market is headed. Uh, today my focus is on long short investing and why today's market is an ideal environment for this kind of strategy. Uh, I'm sure most of you have read or heard uh, headlines uh, regarding the problems with the global economy uh, and that stocks are headed into a bear market. Uh, to that end, I will tell you that we almost always ignore uh, this type of news flow because it tends to be sensationalized media that lacks any real factual basis. A quote that I live by in the financial world is that information is cheap, but insight is priceless. Uh, we are inundated on a daily basis with a barrage of articles that are purposefully polarizing and mostly useless. So for this reason, one of the most critical skills in this industry is the ability to discern between noise, as we refer, it, for, refer to it, and information that is of real value and can be acted on to generate profit. Uh, in this slide, I offer a few headlines that didn't immediately go to my recycle bin. Um, all of these are from, in, are from within the past month, so they constitute live advice. Most of you are familiar with Carl Icahn, the billionaire investor who takes uh, large activist stakes in companies. His investments have historically always been very heavily weighted to the long side, uh, except for today, which is why this caught my eye. Uh, Icahn said last month that a quote-unquote day of reckoning is near for stocks. He liquidated his entire stake in Apple, uh, which had been over $6 billion, and he has now built a 150% net short position. Uh, which is an enormous directional bet against the U.S. stock market. To give this context, it means that with approximately $30 billion in assets under management, if you take the total value of all his shorts and subtract out the total value of all his long positions, you end up with a $45 billion bet against stocks. Uh, so his conviction that the stock market is on the cusp of a major meltdown is high enough uh, that he's willing to use leverage to make 50% more in short bets than the $30 billion that he has already to work with. Fewer of you uh, may be familiar with Stanley Druckenmiller, but his name carries no less weight in the institutional investment world. He is one of the most famous disciples of George Soros, 
uh, ran arguably the greatest hedge fund in history and was so successful that he retired and voluntarily returned his client's capital in 2010 after successfully navigating the 2008 subprime crisis. Uh, he also almost bought the Pittsburgh Steelers, uh, donated nearly $1 billion to charity in a single cal calendar year, uh, and now he simply manages his own money. When asked for a specific recommendation at a recent high-profile hedge fund conference, he simply said, but with absolute conviction, get out of the stock market. Uh, and we can actually, uh, as of yesterday, add, add George Soros himself to this list, as it was reported yesterday uh, that he reduced his equity holdings by 35% in the first quarter, uh, which is a large move for him, uh, and started buying gold. Um, while we definitely share some of Icon and Drucker Miller's views, we have always and will always build our outlook and form our opinion internally from the ground up with real data and Harvard evidence. Specifically, we do agree with them and others in their camp that number one, the effectiveness of central bank policy is diminishing. Uh, two, economic growth is both anemic and decelerating. Three, there is a growing risk that we will at some point in time see a corporate credit crisis, and four, uh, that U.S. stock markets are overvalued. Um, while we do agree with them on these points, we disagree that a significant crisis is imminent. Uh, the reason is simply that the U.S. Federal Reserve and other central banks across the globe are not yet out of ammunition, and they are absolutely still committed to avoiding any type of recession at all costs. This was on full display earlier this year when global markets were entering free fall and central banks responded with more quantitative easing, more stimulus, uh, actually buying stocks in the case of Japan, uh, and now negative interest rates. Um, and in the case of Japan, their central bank uh, is the largest shareholder in their public equity markets, uh, owning approximately 10% of stocks. Um, we believe that so long as central banks still have powder in their kegs, uh, which by the way are not infinite and will eventually be empty, uh, but as long as they still have dry powder, they will provide a backstop to equity markets. Uh, and this essentially creates a floor for stock prices at levels where they will become concerned and take action. Uh, at the same time, it is also very, very clear, no matter what data you're looking at, that their ability to do this is wearing out and their credibility is receding. Uh, and make no mistake about this, uh, they are in the credibility business. It doesn't matter what actions they take, if the markets lose confidence in them, they become instantly powerless. Uh, the enormous problem that they face is while their actions were incredibly successful in preventing another Great Depression, they have failed miserably in creating an economy that is anywhere near able to support itself without stimulus or ultra-loose monetary policy, uh, a state that Ben Bernanke described as escape velocity. Uh, the patient has been on the medicine for so long that he is now addicted and will go into withdrawal without it. Uh, and so we are getting further and further away from escape velocity, not closer. But according to the Fed, uh, the U.S. economy is just a few quarters away from escape velocity, uh, except the problem is the Fed has been saying this for the last four years, and it has failed to come to fruition. Uh, in fact, the economy in almost every single aspect is decelerating and getting closer and closer to stalling out. Uh, it is now more dependent on stimulus than ever, and this, make, this makes the Fed's job of engineering a smooth return to normal policy very unlikely um, and actually almost to the point of impossibility. Uh, we talked about the Fed's backstop creating a floor for stock prices. Well, on the flip side, um, the central bank's growing impotence, along with very, very elevated global debt levels, uh, puts a synthetic ceiling on markets. And so what we are left with, we believe, uh, is this band that stocks will likely trade in and bounce around for the foreseeable future until we reach what I call the end game, uh, which will involve one of two scenarios, and I'll talk about this later on. So instead of the big crash that Icon and Druckenmiller are anticipating, our base case scenario is for ping pong markets with periodic 5 to 15% sell-offs followed by relief rallies, uh, similar to what we've seen uh, in the past months and last summer. Uh, this will go on and on uh, while continuing to more or less confuse the hell out of most investors until central banks fully empty their chambers, uh, and this will be their last uh, desperate measure um, to attempt to inflate asset prices and resurrect the economy, but it will likely fail. Uh, and so we do expect that a crash will happen, uh, just not for another few years, but when it does end, it will not end well. Okay, so let's go back to long, short investing uh, and navigating ping pong markets. Um, we have traditionally 
uh, been long only investors, avoid, uh, avoid market timing, uh, and try to be as pragmatic and open-minded as possible. Uh, what we generally do is devote uh, the majority of our time to doing analysis uh, in order to identify and invest in great companies. Uh, the problem is that recently we have been having a tremendously difficult time finding well-run quality businesses uh, that trade at reasonable or even slightly overvalued prices. Uh, the number of opportunities that we are finding is alarmingly low uh, and, easier lo and easily lower than any time over the past two decades. Uh, what we are finding instead falls into two main categories. Uh, one is highly leveraged cyclical companies that trade at what look to be low, mul low multiples, but in reality uh, are much too high and don't provide uh, uh, enough of a buffer against profit declines. And this, this is critical when you're uh, investing in these types of companies because when uh, a recession comes, uh, their earnings can easily fall 50% or more. And when that happens, uh, you know, their low, seemingly attractive multiple can double or even go negative and get ugly very, very quickly. Uh, these stocks are trading in the 3% dividend yield range, um, which is enticing for a stable defensive company like a utility or big pharma, uh, but not for a cyclical. Uh, these stocks really need to be trading in the 5% plus dividend yield range uh, to provide a large enough safety net. Uh, there are a few stocks out there that are trading in this uh, with these very high dividends. Uh, the problem is that most of them are, are very, very over leveraged um, uh, and at high risk of default or a dividend cut. Uh, over in the second camp, and in my opinion just as scary, we are finding tons of very low growth, very overvalued sluggish companies like a Johnson & Johnson uh, that are trading at valuations that in our opinion uh, should only be paid for the likes of Facebook or Amazon. Uh, unfortunately, as you might imagine, uh, companies that are experiencing high growth right now, uh, which are fewer and far between these days, uh, are trading in a different stratosphere altogether. Well, let's look at some of the actual data. Uh, this chart is pretty self-explanatory. Um, it's not very pretty. Why do we look at nominal GDP instead of real? Well, uh, companies don't report inflation-adjusted sales growth. They just report sales growth. Um, and the impact um, of inflation is different and not necessarily bad for all companies. Uh, some firms with strong products and brand recognition are able to pass through uh, rising costs to their customers, uh, while other companies can suffer immensely from even a small increase in their input costs. But uh, real GDP does give us a strong sense of sort of the general quality of economic growth, uh, so we'll go back to real. Uh, growth was almost non-existent in the first quarter of this year, 0.5%. Uh, optimists will tell you that this is simply due to seasonality, as Q1 is, is usually the weakest quarter of the year, uh, which does tend to be true, but estimates for this quarter are not much better and are being revised down on a weekly basis. Why does this matter? Well, as I alluded to, there is a strong link between nominal GDP and corporate sales. Uh, sales growth has been very, very poor the last few years, and since companies cannot create their own demand, what they focused on uh, is what they could control, and that's namely cost-cutting. Uh, this is one of the tricks, one of the main tricks that allowed them to generate earnings growth on flat or actually declining sales. Uh, they squeezed costs uh, hard and got very lean and very efficient. Uh, the problem is that they can only do that, they can only cut weight for so long until they begin to lose muscle. Uh, and the process of doing so has both sapped global appetite and sacrificed their future demand. Uh, another tool that companies have used is to issue debt um, and buy back their own stock. Uh, debt finance share of purchases in order to uh, increase their per share metrics. Pfizer is a very good example of this, uh, but it's just one of many um, that have been doing it. Uh, this chart is a bit busy. It's somewhat difficult to read, but I'll try to simplify it. The solid blue and solid red bars are what actual sales and actual earnings growth were for Pfizer these past five years. The checkered boxes uh, represent the per share figures. Uh, so what you see is that sales have been down all five of the last five years for Pfizer. Uh, kind of surprising. Uh, their sales have fallen every year. Uh, but their sales per share has actually increased in three of the years, and earnings per share has increased in four of those years. Uh, the problem is that this is absolutely a game of diminishing returns, uh, which is clear from the downward trend in growth, uh, as well as the decreasing boost from the buybacks. Uh, and on top of that, uh, any company's balance sheet can only support so much debt. Um, unfortunately, today, many large corporations are getting near those levels. Uh, this table depicts uh, EPS growth, debt levels, and the forward PE ratio for some of the largest uh, and well-known U.S. companies. 
Uh, and just so you know, when a firm's debt to capital ratio breaches 100, uh, that means they have more debt than total assets, uh, i.e. negative shareholders equity or book value. Uh, some companies are able to operate in this state and they can do so in a stable manner, but there are very, very few of them. Uh, not many banks want to lend to a company uh, that, owns more, that owes more than its underlying collateral is worth. So the median uh, or middle, the median earnings growth rate over the past five years, uh, and this is per share, so it includes that boost uh, from stock buybacks, is 1.8%. Uh, and the median forward price to earnings ratio based on the expectations for this year's earnings, um, which are pretty optimistic in my opinion, is 22. Uh, 22, make no mistake, this is very expensive. In fact, what it means, uh, in our opinion, is that we are much, much closer uh, to a bubble in the U.S. stock market than we are to a normal market. Uh, the United States has been, um, uh, uh, unequivocally, has been in an industrial recession for almost a full year and conditions are getting worse, not better. Okay, yes, but it is no secret that we have been, uh, as, as David mentioned, 88% a service-based economy for several decades, and that manufacturing plays a much smaller role than it used to. Uh, this is very true, but there is still a problem. Uh, retail sales, uh, which has been the last beacon of hope for our economy surviving in a post-stimulus world, uh, retail sales are rolling over, and it looks clear uh, that growth is actually headed to negative territory. Uh, several major retailers, including Macy's, Costco, and Nordstrom's, uh, recently within the past week slashed their year-end sales targets uh, and abandoned giving forward guidance altogether because they have no visibility. Uh, this is very uncommon. It's not at all normal, and I think it is a fairly ominous sign. Uh, as of this morning, you can add Home Depot to this list. Uh, they've been one of the best uh, growth stocks in the recent years. Uh, reported a sharp slowdown in sales growth and comparable same-store sales. So, okay, given all of that, what do we do? What is an appropriate strategy? Well, first, I believe uh, that you absolutely have to be fully hedged at all times to protect against a major market correction or uh, the day of reckoning that, that Icon is waging $45 billion on. Uh, the end game for central banks will ultimately come. Uh, we think it has a low probability of occurring in the near term, but that said, uh, it is still a very real risk at any given moment, uh, and any number of potential external shocks or global geopolitical events can quickly trigger fear and panic in the markets, so stay hedged. Uh, second, after big sell-offs in the market, such as uh, that we saw in uh, January and early February, sift through the wreckage, find the gems, uh, ignore the negative headlines, um, uh, look for overly beaten down companies, and build new long positions. Uh, then as the Fed steps in or markets simply realize that a recession isn't quite yet upon us, uh, gradually begin to pare back and reduce those positions during what we in the industry call relief rallies uh, and sell into strength. Lastly, do not take large bets uh, and avoid getting either overly optimistic or overly pessimistic. Uh, that is until the end game. Uh, and I told you earlier that I would explain what I mean by endgame. Well, what we expect is that one of two things will eventually happen, uh, and it could take a few years. One, uh, and we believe less likely, uh, either the U.S. economy shows consistent signs of accelerating and finally achieves uh, what Ben Bernanke called escape velocity, or two, and more likely, uh, the Fed and global central banks run out of ammo uh, and lose credibility in the faith of the markets. Then what you do uh, is you stay on the sidelines uh, while that 5 to 10 percent correction uh, that previously had uh, reverted um, uh, and you had been playing in those ping pong markets um, and you wait while this 5 to 10 percent correction evolves into a somewhat nasty and long-lasting bear market. Uh, but until then, uh, safe investing to all.